I am absolutely delighted to introduce Dr. Krista Harrison, who is an associate professor in the Division of Geriatrics and the Philip R. Lee Institute for Health Policy Studies. Uh, she's a former hospice administrator and social scientist who is a leader in health policy, public health ethics, and aging and palliative care research. Uh, Dr. Harrison completed her PhD in health policy and bioethics at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, her postdoctoral training in aging research and implementation science here at UCSF, and an Atlantic Fellowship for Equity and Brain Health at the Global Brain Health Institute. And we were so delighted when she joined the UCSF faculty in geriatrics in 2017. The focus of her research is to mitigate the suffering for people impacted by serious illness or dementia. And I just have to say the breadth of her research expertise is impressive. It ranges from qualitative studies focused on people living with dementia, uh, care partners, hospice clinicians, to large data set studies on the unmet needs and healthcare outcomes of people living with dementia. So just amazing. And then she has several leadership roles, including co-leading the Vulnerable Aging Research Corps for our Pepper Center, um, as well as an assistant director for our T32 Aging Research Fellowship, and also is the associate director of training and director of the Philip R. Lee Health Policy Postdoctoral Fellowship. So thank you so much, Krista. I'm really looking forward to your talk. Thank you so much for having me, Louise. And uh, I will say at the jump that the artwork you'll see throughout the presentation uh, is are borrowed from my uh, family members. My grandmother is, uh, this is her artwork on the title. Uh, and then uh, you'll see other pieces by my mother and uh, brother throughout. Just adds a little literal color. So just to give you uh, a sense of what to expect, uh, and I've given you the sort of images that are associated with the, the pivot points throughout this talk. I'll begin by level setting about the public health problem of dementia, then talk about some research that I and others have done about uh, living with dementia and, through, and looking at those needs through a geriatric palliative care lens. The, uh, what we've learned about dying from dementia and uh, receipt of hospice care. And then a little bit about grieving dementia. And finally, recommendations for change. So the public health problem of dementia. Uh, if you've been to a talk about dementia, you've heard this recently, but there's an estimated 6.5 million people in the United States who are, are living with dementia. This includes one in nine people over age 65, one in three over age 85, and uh, an estimated 200,000 that are under age 65 who have early onset uh, dementia. But this doesn't just affect the people living with dementia, it also affects all the people who love and care for them. Uh, so an estimated 11 million people act as unpaid caregivers and, and that time that they spend is estimated to be worth billions of dollars more than the, the, uh, the sort of annual uh, revenue of Walmart. We often don't think about the fact that dementia is a life-limiting serious illness. So in, in this chart that uh, Lauren Hunt and I, who collaborate frequently, created for a, a, a editorial we titled Dying with Dementia, you can see that the, the um, rate of people dying from Alzheimer's disease, as reflected in, in the codes, uh, have increased dramatically over time and it continues to rise and Alzheimer's is in the top five to six uh, causes of death um, on a regular basis these days. And this problem is just going to get worse as the population ages. Right now uh, it's six point, uh, what did I say? 6.5 million and uh, by, 2060, it's going to have more than doubled to 13.8 million people affected by dementia, and that's just in the United States. So this is um, something that requires a little more attention. And then we, of course, there are a lot of disparities and equities, inequities for uh, people from uh, racial and ethnic groups that have been historically excluded and minoritized. So for example, the prevalence of dementia is, is estimated to be nearly 19% among Black and African Americans, 14% among Hispanic or Latino Americans, and 10% um, 
uh, among white Americans. So in other words, that's twice as high among black Americans and one and a half times as high among Hispanic Americans. Uh, and this higher risk is due to the accumulation of health and socioeconomic disparities caused by structural racism or, uh, and not because of genetics. Um, and of course, this is exacerbated by missed and delayed diagnoses, especially where comorbidities come into account. So for those of you who uh, were able to attend Journal Club in the Division of Geriatrics today, you learned a bit more about this from this uh, 2001 JAMA Neurology paper. So now I'm gonna switch gears and talk about what we've learned about the experience of living with dementia. And this, uh, what I'm gonna speak about comes from a constellation of studies that we're really aiming to look at what are the geriatric palliative care needs of people living with dementia um, and or their care partners. And so on the left, you see a series of boxes um, describing a, a qualitative study we did in a large academic medical memory care center we interviewed people with living with mild to moderate dementia who could self-report, current caregivers of people around the same stage of disease and former caregivers of decedents. Um, we triangulated this data with chart reviews of 700, about 750 decedents who had received care at the same academic me memory care center, so a bit of a larger sample, uh, and then triangulated that again with um, nationally representative survey, the National Health Aging and Trend Study linked to claims data, which let us get more of a, a sense of what's happening on a population level. So you'll see um, different types of studies showing up uh, in the subsequent slides. Uh, and I just wanna acknowledge that there's a real lack of diversity of participants, um, you know, compared to the estimated prevalence uh, or the higher prevalence in racial and ethnic minoritized groups. Our samples had somewhere between, um, you know, 6% to 20% of people from racial ethnic minoritized groups uh, or who had low income and uh, for the qualitative people that's for the Bay Area adjusted rates uh, and then, um, you know, 20, 17 to 20% or up to 40% of people with low educational attainment. And so that's some diversity, but I, I'm hoping that in my future work, I can, I can do a lot better. So I just wanted to acknowledge that. So now, before I tell you uh, about this qualitative work, I wanted to acknowledge that uh, Dr. Sarah Garrett did all the data collection for this study, and uh, Medina Halim has done a ton of the coding and analysis in partnership with me. So the study we wanted to do was to look to identify formative data to inform developing better clinical interventions. And we were really coming at this from the point of view of thinking about palliative care and geriatric needs. We um, used the National Consensus Project for uh, Quality Palliative Care as part of our framework for how we designed the study. You know, at some point, I we tried to use that as a coding framework, and it really didn't work. So we ended up simplifying it to just what are the sources of distress and what are the sources of support, and they fell in these four big buckets: those related to the disease, social and relational sources of distress or support, caregiving sources, or those related to clinical care and care systems. So I'll tell you more about this. First, I wanna give you a sense of, of what people actually said. And I wanna start with sources of support because so often with dementia, we talk about all the things that are hard and bad, but people really found a lot of ways to find support. Uh, so for example, um, in the social and relational category, people talked about uh, support groups quite a bit. And this uh, current care partner said, that group was very helpful because everybody had different solutions and different things they had gone through where they could be helpful with what you do and what you don't do. And then in the category of clinical care and care systems, a different care, current caregiver said, it's helpful to know the diagnosis, to not just be in this gray zone. So we could begin to plan, think about the future. And then in the other four categories or other two categories rather, I, the sources of distress were examples, like the classic uh, behavioral disease-oriented challenges 
last night in the middle of the night, he was hitting me and kind of screaming in his sleep. And I tried to wake him up. It seemed in his dream only to provoke him more. And he really became physically violent. And caregiver oriented challenges were the toll and obligation of caregiving. This former care partner said, I'm on call 24 hours a day. I'm dealing with something I'm clueless about and I don't know where it's going and how fast it's going. And my wife is disappearing. It's not an easy thing to navigate. So we summarized all those findings into this figure um, and lots of detail available if you'd like to go look at it, but I'll walk you through a, a few of these. Um, for example, the you heard a little about the distressing manifestations as one of the challenges is disease oriented uh, sources of distress, but there was also the implications of the disease, the uncertainty of the prognosis and the timeline, the incremental losses experienced along the way, the lack of affordable or accessible resources. So things that weren't available uh, at home or after hours for working people with dementia or care partners. Um, in the category of social and relational challenges, there were a lot of relationship changes, not just between the person living with dementia and care partner, but also the broader social network. There are a lot of constrained social and professional opportunities, again, depending on what stage of life both the person living with dementia and care partner were at. And then there was, there was grief showing up. There was incremental, anticipatory, and post-death grief. In the category of caregiving, a lot of ob obligations of caregiving, the, the physical, emotional, and mental toll of caregiving, and also family misalignment disagreements about care or the decisions being made. Clinical care challenges included the impact of assessments and, and the diagnosis on the person with dementia and care partner. Um, two of our nine uh, people with dementia participating in our study talked about having a suicidality thoughts after receiving the diagnosis. Participants talked about not feeling like they were getting enough guidance from clinicians. And for those uh, clinicians who didn't have expertise in dementia, there was really a desire to, to have that, um, a lot of issues with medications. And then of course the ubiquitous care fragmentation and system gaps, uh, of course, there were also a lot of supports. People found information, programs, resources to teach them to learn about the, the disease. They, they found activities and strategies to manage the symptoms. Often these were learned from support groups and particularly um, people who had more rare forms of dementia like a, a Lewy body dementia, or early onset or frontotemporal dementia, they really benefited disease specific or um, life stage specific support groups. Um, and you know, as many colleagues have uh, researched in other studies, uh, Dr. Smith, Dr. Allison, Dr. O, oh, engaging people with dementia in meaningful and social activities is important and has to be a continual adaptation process that is possible. Um, and then finally, in the re social relational category, people talked about the supports and strategies they use to manage their grief. In caregiving, unsurprisingly, there was a lot of talk of help of tangible help with instrumental and basic activities of daily living and housework. They really appreciated when they got help with paperwork and planning, like advanced care planning. Um, resilience strategies were incredibly helpful. Uh, and then for those who had a uh, prior experience with dementia or uh, professional connections, say they used to work at a certain large institution nearby, uh, those enabling factors were, were, were really helpful. Uh, and in, in the clinical care and care systems, information and guidance, including receiving a diagnosis was considered helpful. Uh, the diagnosis, particularly when it was again, a more rare uh, dementia or a strange constellation of symptoms that having the diagnosis helped explain what was going on. People really appreciated clear, supportive and timely interactions with clinicians, unsurprisingly. And the, the various types of services that people said were supportive included specialty dementia care, home-based services, hospice, palliative care, and geriatrics. 
So I'm going to take a moment to do a little bit more of a, a deep dive in some of these particular domains. Um, Dr. Adi Shapir did this really nice work uh, exploring the concepts of anticipatory guidance a, li a little bit more. Uh, and this quote speaks to people's desire for prognosis and guidance. I guess I, what I would really like to know is what's going to happen next? What's the next thing that's going to happen with this type of dementia? I mean, does he just quit eating? Does he just quit breathing? So Dr. Shapir, when she was a uh, Jerry Powell fellow in our group, created this, um, both looked through the empirical data, but uh, matched it with um, some of the palliative care literature. Uh, and so she boiled this down to um, where people wanted uh, anticipatory guidance was in the categories of prognosis and expected disease trajectory, including uh, unique aspects of particular dementia syndrome types, um, and, and being clear that dementia is can be a terminal condition. The, the second category was behavioral safety and communication issues, like forewarning of what common behavioral challenges can be. And then the third category was all of the elements of planning for the future, um, including advanced care planning and transitions to different care settings. So why does this really matter? Well, how if people, um, advanced care planning is a process per uh, Rebecca Sidori's definitions uh, and many others. And so you engage in it potentially multiple times at multiple stages with different amounts of data. And um, in the context of dementia, if the person with dementia is going to be able to participate in a um, particularly verbal way, it needs to happen early enough. Uh, so we looked at it in a cross-sectional national survey to just say, what is happening? And we looked at this in a couple different ways, but in this particular sub-analysis, we looked at in the green, people with no dementia, and in the blue, people with dementia, this is all older adults, Medicare beneficiaries, and looked at three different aspects of advanced care planning, uh, end of life conversation, durable power of attorney and advanced directive. And the good news is lots of people have done this, um, half or more. Uh, but on the other hand, the people with dementia are at a, a quite a bit of a lower level, um, particularly for having a conversation or documenting an, an advanced directive. But this again was, we didn't know where they were receiving care. We didn't know how proximate this was to death. We didn't know if, um, uh, much, and this is a heterogeneous group. So then we looked, uh, Nicole Boyd, who's a, a fourth year medical student now at UCSF, uh, did the 400, uh, sorry, 750 chart reviews. Um, and she looked specifically in the context of memory clinic, uh, people who had died after receiving care at the memory clinic. And what she found looking at the same topic was, um, first of all, the any advanced care element is in the green here and advanced directives is specifically in the blue. And on the far right, what you can see is 47% of people had no documented advanced care planning. And for those who had anything documented, most of it happened before the first visit. And this just tells you there's opportunity for improvement. It's a really ch challenging conversation and often people aren't sure whose job it is. They want, um, often people assume the, the primary care physician or provider rather will um, take responsibility for it. And I would encourage people to just think there are a lot of opportunities to just open the door a little bit to start conversations and begin the process or, or move the process forward. And why? Well, the stakes are kind of high. We did this qualitative study in hospice organizations and a hospice nurse said, most, I, we were surprised to hear this. Most people we get with an Alzheimer's diagnosis have had that diagnosis for many, many years and yet they're coming into hospice relatively unprepared for having discussions about their wishes for end of life. 
And of course, as this hospice executive said, most of them, by the time we see them, if they've not done it, they can't do it. And that's specifically speaking to the hospice enrollee. And then one more piece I wanna tell you about with regards to living with dementia is the need and use of home-based care because often we assume and that most people are with dementia are in nursing facilities. And there is a stage in, of time in which that is true, but the vast majority of people living with dementia are living at home. Um, and uh, as again, Nicole Boyd's work has shown uh, using again, that chart review, among people living with dementia seen at a specialized memory care center, 42% became lost to follow-up before death. That means that there was no plan for follow-up. Um, and if the common reasons for not returning to clinic care, care was the logistical difficulty in accessing care or functional challenges, which again, not surprising. It's a neurodegenerative syndrome, they progress over time, it makes it really challenging to come in. Um, and uh, Dr. Ornstein, who's at Hopkins, has done quite a bit of work around the use of home-based care. And her works, her recent work looking at um, people, Medicare beneficiaries, found that 44% are receiving home-based clinical care, which is much higher than the, those without dementia. And more specifically for for house calls, for home-based medical care, people with dementia receive five times more and twice as much skilled home health than people with no dementia. So this is clearly in demand, but there's a huge caveat that the availability of home-based care is wildly variable across the United States. Um, a lot of differences in access and quality. And so this, uh, this is just an aside, but one of our big policy needs is payment models that support interdisciplinary clinical, functional, and social care at home before the end of life, which is a little bit of foreshadowing. Uh, we also, because I, I had this question of if so much research and particularly in the geriatric palliative care space has been done in nursing home settings, what's happening at home where we have relatively little data? And so we use this nationally representative survey and HATS to look at what is happening at home. And we look specifically among people with dementia and severe disability. Um, over a five year study period, we found 2.2 million are probably living at home with dementia and se severe disability. And they have really high clinical needs. So in the orange, you see people at home in the light blue, people with residen in residential care settings like assisted living and in dark blue in nursing facilities. Uh, and ac across the board, you see pretty high bars in the orange and often as high or higher than in the dark blue bars. So people are, are living at home without um, a lot of those systematic supports that you'd get, particularly in nursing facilities. Uh, and so then uh, Kate Radcliffe, who uh, worked with me while doing her master's as part of the joint medical care program, just published this paper doing a, a little bit of a deep dive and she compared what current caregivers said about their experiences thinking about care settings versus uh, what former caregivers said in retrospect. Um, so among the current caregivers, all 16 were caring for the person with dementia in the home. And they just talked about this overwhelming uncertainty about what was gonna happen and desire for guidance about care settings. Former care part partners, uh, six of them had cared for the person with dementia at home until death, three had short-term institutionalizations, and six had a sort of final institutionalization where the person moved into a, a nursing facility and stayed there. And what they said is that retrospectively, they, could, they wanted or appreciated explicit guidance from their clinical providers about either institutional placement or what it would take to get support to stay in the home setting. Because of course, care at home requires an immense amount of resources, referrals and preparation. Um, so summing up this section about living at home with dementia and sort of in reverse order that I've talked about it, there's a desire and need for home-based care uh, at a variety of disease stages, because not least ambulatory and clinic-based care is really challenging as the disease progresses. 
There's a lot of opportunities to engage in the advanced care planning process more. There's desire for clinicians to provide anticipatory guidance and planning. Um, and then finally, I, I sort of set this up, but I didn't say it explicitly. As people are thinking about doing clinical intervention development, you can use these sources of distress as gaps or the needs to target and the sources of support as inspiration and things that can be built from and expanded upon. Okay, shifting gears. And um, this uh, painting in the background was the one painting my grandmother uh, took with her to um, hospice. So why are we talking about dying with dementia? Because one in three older adults die with or from dementia. And an increasing number die at home. So in the purple, you see the people dying in, in over time in nursing home or long-term care settings. But in the turquoise is the uh, showing the increase in people dying in the decedent's home, uh, the oranges in hospice facilities. So one of the studies we did again with that nationally representative NHAT survey was look at what is the median time to death in for people in home and community-based settings. And again, this is in the population of people with dementia and severe disability. On average, it's 1.7 years. We found that 25% die within seven months. And we were not doing fancy prognostic models. I leave that to colleagues. But for just a sense of sort of clinical heuristics, for the it was a, a shorter life expectancy for people who were aged 90 and older, who were bed bound, who were homebound, who had comorbid cancer, who had unintended weight loss, or who had comorbid depression. But I will note, if you would like that fancier uh, prognostic information, uh, Dr. Deerdorf recently completed one uh, and it is now in uh, e-prognosis. And I see your question about uh, should dementia routinely be presented to patients as a terminal disease around the time of diagnosis? Um, I, I think there is a, my instinct is not at the first, but maybe in subsequent couple of appointments, because I think people need time to process that information. And, and I didn't mention this, but it's really important to ask permission and um, assess for what is the level of information people want uh, about their diagnosis. Um, all right, continuing on. Oop. I gotta figure out how to close, okay, sorry. So as I mentioned, people are dying at home in increasing amounts, but what are the systems of support for dying at home? Well, the typical ones are home health, home-based medical care, the house calls programs, um, where it's available, are the program for all-inclusive care for the elderly or PACE models. Uh, but hospice is also the most common method. Uh, and we're just gonna take a, a mild uh, nerdy interlude to talk in detail about hospice because I love doing that. Um, and I think often we don't talk about what the origins of hospice ethos and care philosophy uh, were. So it really came about in the 1960s and 70s when 60% of deaths in the United States were caused by cancer. Cure was relatively rare. And the founders in England, Dame Cicely Saunders, and in Connecticut, um, uh, Florence Wald in, uh, at Yale, they were white Christians. And so their values uh, had a big impact on the, the core values of hospice, which was really focused on the autonomy and dignity of the dying person and the philosophy that there can be meaning making and growth right up until uh, the, the very moment of death. Um, and I should also say in the United States that this was also part of the counterculture movement. It was led by volunteers. It was amid a broader deinstitutional effort. So it really focused on how do we make you comfortable in, at home and in, in wherever you call home uh, and, and minimize the involvement of um, 
the medical involvement. Uh, and note that when I'm foreshadowing with the problem with autonomy uh, of the dying person is when it's somebody with dementia who's dying, uh, as it gets expanded to over time, it, it gets a little more complicated. The Medicare hospice benefit in the United States came about uh, after the 1980 demonstration project uh, where they were trying to show all the different ways and, and build a, a payment model that would allow hospice to expand. And in the negotiations with the Reagan administration, there were a lot of concerns about um, how are we gonna limit the cost? How are we gonna, um, yeah. And so when the 1982 Medicare hospice benefit came into uh, effect, there were a couple of res key restrictions that were really oriented around cost. So one of them was, we don't wanna just care for everybody forever. Why, why would we do that? Um, the limited uh, prognosis to six months or less. And again, in the context of cancer as the predominant diagnosis that made a little more sense at the time, people had to agree to forego, to trade off the sort of traditional curative and really part A hospital-based medical services. Uh, and at the time, um, the duration of care was limited to 210 days total. Um, and in return, there was a per diem re reimbursement model. So you get a steady amount of money every day and you could use that to balance the costs of uh, lower cost patients and higher cost basement patients, but you could sort of predict what's coming. But over time, and I have to thank Lauren Hunt for some of these slides um, used with permission, she and I work a lot together on these topics. Uh, there's just been an explosive growth in hospice with the number of hospices tripling between 1990 and 2000 and doubling again between 2000 and 2010. A lot of the increases have been driven by large for-profit corporately owned chain hospices. The business model is increasingly to enroll long stay, low need patients. Uh, and this chart shows uh, all hospices in the blue, the for-profits in the orange track, the growth of the all, and you can see the nonprofits stay pretty stable and are in fact starting to dip down again. Uh, and ultimately, I don't think it's the for-profit nonprofit matters. It's what do you do with the, the money? It's how do you behave? How does, what does it look like for your patients? And um, there's been quite a bit of work uh, by Ava Kaufman and other reporters about the fraud and, um, and concerning aspects of the hospice business model, which is frankly not that different from the rest of healthcare. It's just a little more morally concerning in the concepts in the in the context of people who are dying. Uh, and then also Melissa Aldridge didn't have space. To, to cite all of her amazing work, but she has done an immense amount of work showing that in fact, for-profit care from for-profit organization is on average associated with worse outcomes for people with dementia. Uh, and uh, some of you know, I have written from my personal experience, this is a picture of my stepfather and stepbrother um, as my stepfather was dying, that uh, hospice, really ends up as a result of this conflict between the business model and the ethos. They have this implicit need for you to die quickly. And if you are dying slowly and reluctantly, the, the systems are not currently allowed, aligned to allow that, which is a real problem. So what does this have to do with dementia? Well, hospice is, is effectively the gold standard for end of life care. At this point, it serves 52% of Medicare decedents, uh, which is 1.7 million people each year. They receive interdisciplinary care wherever they call home, um, medical uh, medications, durable medical equipment, uh, and it's really supposed to be aligned uh, uh, with a care plan based on what the, the person and the family needs. An estimated 16% of the older uh, hospice decedents have a principal hospice diagnosis of dementia. So you have to have um, sort of something 
on your list of diagnoses that is uh, detailed as the thing that is most likely to kill you. And that is called the principal hospice diagnosis. Um, but we had to say, we asked ourselves like, is that, is that really it? It seems like it might be more. So we looked at the, the issue of uh, people who might not have a principal diagnosis of dementia, but have a coexisting diagnosis of dementia. Um, and again, we used the National Health Aging and Trends Study, and we found twice as many people have coexisting dementia in hospice, enrolled in hospice, as have principal diagnoses of dementia. So what this looks like, 43% of people with heart failure as their principal diagnosis have coexisting dementia. 38% of people with cancer, 34% of people with COPD. So this is kind of an invisible population. We were able to use this data set in a way that the, the hospice claims aren't used to, to be able to look at this problem. And so then of course you need to ask, well, do they have similar needs or different needs? Uh-oh, I apologize, I forgot. Um, we found that while most of them do have an awareness of the diagnosis, a substantial support proportion don't even necessarily know that they have diagnosis and these are predominantly uh, proxy respondents in the survey. Um, so back to the, how do these groups compare? So in the blue is people with coexisting dementia, all hospice enrollees. Um, in the orange are people with uh, principal dementia diagnoses and gray is no dementia. And so what you see is that people with coexisting and principal dementia have high functional needs versus people with no dementia have pretty low functional needs by and large. And frankly, that's what the hospice model is based on is not needing a lot of daily support or at least support that can be provided by family and friends, people who might live with you. Symptom needs, which is what quintessentially hospice is helpful with, um, you, we found that in people with coexisting dementia, it's as high or off, sometimes higher than people with no dementia. So um, for example, with depression, depression is higher in coexisting dementia than no dementia. And again, this is, this is suggesting that hospice, um, wondering if the hospice model is well aligned to this invisible population of people with coexisting dementia. And then another study we did that combined both these groups, we looked at how, what is, does hospice actually help? And it turns out it benefits or at least doesn't hurt with people with dementia. So we looked across the best measures that exist right now of last month of life care quality, just among people with dementia, hospice enrollment is associated with as good or higher quality of care versus those not enrolled in dementia. So for example, um, in the blue here is no hospice and orange is hospice in the last month of life. And you'll see the orange bars are higher for excellent quality of life and having anxiety and, mad, man, and sadness managed and much lower for having a late uh, in the last three days of life transition to another care setting. Uh, and when we compared this to people with um, no dementia, it, it actually looks uh, pretty similar. So amazing, that tells you hospice is a surprisingly decent, flexible model, despite being founded in the context of cancer. Um, but our real concern is that people with dementia might be disproportionately impacted by all of the efforts to curb cough, profit and fraud in hospice. So um, uh, these researchers at uh, GW did this really nice analysis looking at um, how care of people with dementia in hospice has changed over time. So what you'll see in orange, there are tiny little lines. There are policies that went into effect trying to curb the costs. But what you see is that the slope of the line on the left before the first orange line is much higher and that's care days of people or days that people with dementia received care. And then after the last orange line, you'll see that line is a lot flatter. So again, we're worried that this is 
is not great for people with dementia receiving care from hospice. And that wouldn't be such a problem, except the other options are not great. So again, implications, summing up this section, hospice is remarkably flexible model, given that it can accommodate people with dementia, but it's not yet flexible enough. We really need some improvements to serve this invisible population with coexisting dementia, and frankly, to just better serve the unique, specific needs of people with dementia. Um, on average, it ex improves experience at the very end of life. And I didn't show you this because the paper's under review, but Dr. Aldrich has done some great work that shows, particularly among community-dwelling people uh, who are enrolled up to six months in hospice, it reduced costs for Medicare and for family members, which is, I can't wait to cite this. Um, and then in the future, we've got a bunch of projects planned to look into how do we really actually need to improve hospice care for people with dementia going forward. Okay, grieving dementia. So again, as many of you know, I come into my interest with grief um, from personal experience with my father. And so I really had to level up what I knew about grief because I hadn't had to grapple with the grief of that magnitude before. Um, and what I learned was that there's, there's a tremendous amount of heterogeneity in grief. It differs by the relationship, the, the nature of loss, what caused the loss, how that interacts with prior losses or other things going on, the intensity, the duration. Um, and then there's all these types of grief. There's normal grief. There's um, complicated or prolonged grief. There's compounded grief. Uh, they all have slightly different definitions and often aren't consistently defined um, with the exception of um, the new DSM diagnosis. And for the people who feel the need to grapple with the grief directly, it seems like having a large toolkit of strategies to manage grief um, can be really helpful. And this is often lear learned from near peers. So people who have gone through a similar grief. Um, and so that made me wonder, well, how is that playing out in dementia given there are so many losses? There's the cognitive and functional changes of the person with dementia, the social professional changes, the continuous no negotiation between the, the, both the uh, incremental and anticipatory loss and then the ongoing relationship between the person with dementia and the care partner. And so I did a little sleuthing to find out what is the, what do we know about what I learned is called pre-death grief in dementia. Uh, so the caveat for the prevalence is that it's really hard to determine without diagnostic criteria and clinical tools. You can't measure, but you don't have anything to measure it with. Um, but the guess was 10 to 18 percent um, associated factors with having higher rates of pre-death grief were being a spouse, having less educational attainment, caring for someone with advanced dementia, uh, and having greater burden and depression. And in fact, there's a synergistic effect of grief with burden and then that subsequently increases depression. But there's no real differences that have been observed by dementia etiology. So for example, with uh, Alzheimer's versus Lewy body versus Parkinson's dementia, it really, the differences in pre-death grief seem to be driven by the caregiver and person with dementia characteristics or their most disturbing symptoms. So for example, behavior, personality changes and sleep issues have the biggest impact on pre-death grief. Post-death grief, the prevalence is six to 26%. And I realized I am not clear if they mean complicated grief or normal grief, because um, it seems low for normal grief. Uh, factors associated with higher post-death grief are again, lower educational attainment, more depression and more pre-death grief. But they think that social support probably moderates that relationship with pre-death and post-death grief. Um, and so I just wanted to share some of the ways that grief showed up in our interviews with care partners that I started out this talk with. I'm grieving what I had, the way we were, the way he was. There's times when I just, I literally hurt inside. I actually feel pain. I feel hurt and I can't always make it go away. And I'm trying to recreate my life. How do you recreate your life when you're 73? 
Well, I'm still grieving. I still think about her a lot. I dream about her. There are still times when I'm distracted. Oh, I got to go see mom today. And I realize he's not going to be there. I'd say, and this was a, a source of support quote, um, I'd say for the last three months of his life, he was never without stuffed animal. So now I sleep with a stuffed animal. And it's kind of comforting. So again, I did some inter research on what are the interventions to address grief in the dementia context. Pre-death, there's counseling and support groups. Um, a, a number of these studies were done in uh, Singapore. So they talked about dementia care services, which were like adult day care centers, and they attenuate the effect of burden, but not grief. Paid caregivers attenuate the burden and partially attenuate the grief. Post-death, there's counseling and then bereavement support groups, sounding similar. Um, and it wasn't too much said about that, except notably self-reported need was twice as high than the actual use of those services. And I saw some of that in our own qualitative work as well. Um, there are not a ton of interventions out there. Notably, uh, Sheer and Bloom seem to have one of the few uh, interventions that have been showed to pos have a positive impact on complicated grief. And so this was a study that adapted their grief intervention program. Um, and it's, you know, 10 hour and a half sessions uh, that really focus on accepting situations, promoting strategies uh, in activities, and thinking about how to uh, manage the adversive moments with the person with dementia differently. Tested in a quasi-experimental design in Spain and shown to improve grief symptoms, caregiver burden, resilience, post-traumatic growth, and the caregiver quality of life. So that's, that was a neat one to um, read about. Post-grief interventions, I'm not coming across much uh, in the context of dementia. Um, a lot of them focused on the care partner cognitive, cognitive skills. Oh, no, sorry. The interventions focused on care partner cognitive skills um, reduced quote unquote normal grief, whereas those that focused on the care partner or care recipient behaviors reduced complicated grief. But it seemed if if this was truly the most that's out there, I think there's a lot of work to be done. So I'm going to leave you with two key theories. The first uh, about grief, which is that meaning reconstruction theory is an explanatory model of mourning. Meaning making is the capability of grievers to accept loss, realize growth, and reorganize personal identity in the context of loss. It's a mediator of complicated and normal, or I think it's called constructive grief. And then this dual process theory of grief is one I really like. Um, it talks about the way that in everyday life experience, grievers oscillate between loss-oriented and restoration-oriented work. So loss-oriented work might be the classic mourning activities, um, whereas restoration-oriented might be denial or avoidance and uh, doing new things. Um, so it just speaks to how you, you can't just, or many people can't grieve all the time. They have to sort of bounce back and forth between ways of being. Um, in the last couple minutes, I want to leave you with recommendations for change. The first is, if you're really interested in the anticipatory guidance, I highly recommend you check out Dr. Shafir's paper on anticipatory guidance. She did this really nice job pulling together, again, the, the palliative care literature and synthesizing it in the context of the empirical data and giving recommendations for what types of anticipatory guidance you might provide at different stages of disease, and then gave examples of how you might do that, like the asking for permission that I was speaking about earlier. Um, I've got a, a paper under review right now where we propose a, a dementia geriatric neuropalliative care approach, and it includes a roadmap for clinical care and um, we envision this as something that people could use no matter their discipline, no matter um, 
their where they are in the process and it sort of again that advice about what are the types of things you need to think about such as enabling meaningful activities for the person with dementia throughout the care experience uh, or in um, moderate to severe dementia think about how to customize preventive care depending on time to benefit and goals but of course clinical visits are only part of what we overall need. We, there's a lot of infrastructure needed to make sure that no matter where somebody with dementia shows up in the clinical system, that they will get dementia competent care. And that includes making sure that dementia competencies are added to the training curriculum across all clinical disciplines or all disciplines, including therapists and other health professionals. Um, interdisciplinary team, cross-learning, observational opportunities, learning opportunities, um, having clear billing procedures and other processes like e-consults or referral pathways, making sure that there's resources available, things as simple as note templates to make the documentation easy or having the forms available, um, repositories of local patient and family facing materials. And then finally, all the wraparound support services, behavioral management clinics, social work, grief counseling, um, many more I haven't mentioned. And then of course, all the things that make this more accessible to people from the wide variety of lived experiences that we hope to serve, including after hours options for working caregivers and interpreting services for people with limited English proficiency. And, and of course, we need mechanisms to pay for all this. And uh, as I have argued in, in the article, this is really in self-interest um, because we don't want this to be the major public, a major public health problem, but if it affects our individual lives, we're sure as heck gonna want those, those resources to be there. So bringing it all together, general takeaways. I recommend using a dementia geriatric neuropalliative care approach to keep patients and care partners at the center of everything that's done and their needs. To identify and validate both supports and challenges for the person with dementia, care partners, and whoever's in their family of choice, not just biologic family members. Um, Sometimes it helps to just acknowledge that the care gaps are numerous, especially in dementia care, and that there's lots of opportunities to improve communication. Um, this also gives us plenty of targets for intervention work. And finally, dying and grieving are normal parts of the process, but they also require support. And with that, there are just a few people, well, there's many, many, many people I need to acknowledge, not least those who participated in research or contributed the data, artwork by my family members. I've been very fortunate in having a variety of funding sources and even more fortunate in the, the wide number of team members I've had the opportunity to collaborate with, um, many of whom I'm sure are not even on this list because I've been really fortunate in all the people I've gotten to work with. So with that, I realize I've left very little time. And so you have my email to uh, for additional questions, but with that, I will stop. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Krista. That was really a terrific talk. Um, yeah, so I'm, I have a couple questions. Uh, one of the things I always, you know, you talked about tailoring. I mean, hospice obviously is one component of the care roadmap that you talked about. And it, it obviously, I really appreciated you talking about the history and how it was came out with the cancer model. Things about how could we better push for hospice to have more of a tailored approach for dementia. I still see my patients with dementia in hospice getting the traditional comfort pack, right, which has like anticholinergics and Haldol and things. I'm like, oh, I don't know if that's actually going to help the comfort of my patients. Um, is there a push or what, what can we do to sort of have this idea of tailoring it for people who have dementia? Yeah, so that is um, very timely because I am writing the grant about that right now to find out. Uh, and one of the things that that we are currently planning to do, if we are so fortunate to be funded, is to find out who's doing this well and what are they doing and how are they adapting? Because it seems to be very uh, dependent on the expertise of the people in that hospice organization. And so from that, like, 
what are what are people doing well now or what do they want to see happen and what do patients and families want we can start making recommendations for both how do hospices change their individual practices and create professional guidelines and ethics norms but we can also say states here are some policy recommendations of things you could change federal government should there ever be a policy window uh, organizations that do the advocacy work um, here's our list of recommendations we'd like to pass on to you about where we need to make changes fantastic yeah. thank you for doing the work <laughs> um, and then we have a, a question here of thanks krista for this important topic do you have any thoughts on what might be some of the ways to pay for the services which i agree are needed uh yeah um i mean first of all right now things sometimes look cheap because we decide not to measure the counterfactual right we we say well family members take care of things and we just won't measure the fact that that means they they can't be in the workforce and they can't um do other things that are meaningful or they can't uh help pay save for their kid to go to college or whatever the other things they're doing with their time and expertise um so one thing is we we can start counting better um the other piece is um I think there's still a lot of work to be done on playing around with innovative payment models that allow for those interdisciplinary models of care because dementia is not a medical only problem. It doesn't require just physicians. Uh, so we need to find ways to bring in all the different interdisciplinary team members that need to be part of it. Um, and also if I had good answers about how to pay for it, I'd probably be running a business. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, another one just popped in a, a question is, does the National Hospice and Palliative Care Organization have guidelines for dementia care yet? Good question. I'll go check later. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll look at it. And also, I was just thinking about, as you're saying, how it, you know, there's a need for non-medical services. I, I think your work on grief um, in terms of supports and strategies is so important. And thinking how to tailor that specifically again around dementia how available are some of these uh resources uh for people with dementia or their caregivers especially ones that are informed or tailored for for dementia uh relatively little um i mean there's relatively few grief supports generally that are organized they're often expensive um the um for there, every hospice is supposed to provide bereavement supports for uh, both community members, but particularly for people who die in their organization for up to a year. It sometimes happens. It doesn't always, it doesn't always get offered. It often has to be paid for in a different way. Um, it's not, it's where the regulations and oversight falls short. Um, I've also seen new uh, innovations like uh, help texts which is grief support created by both um, experts and grievers that has been tailored over time and it's been uh it's now been expanded to uh clinicians who need a little extra grief support from their professional work after the pandemic among other things um but uh, you know i'd love to see that be adapted specifically to a, the dementia context I mean, so I think there are those sort of innovative partnerships that are possible in the future that use um, new platforms to provide lower cost interventions than a expert 190 to 120 minute sessions over eight weeks or 10 weeks. Great. And, I, and we'll, this will be the final question is, uh, what role will uh, community home-based palliative care programs play in addressing the challenges of caring for patients with dementia? If we can find how to pay for it. <laughs> Great question. Yeah. So the the question is right. The how to pay for it is is maybe the biggest concern because you know in my heart of hearts I, I love hospice, but I don't know if it's the best model. Um, I don't know what's going to be the best strategy. So I would much rather see the additional option of home and community based palliative and geriatric care, but I, I do want to be clear that for dementia, you need all the competencies. It can't just be one of the disciplines. It just doesn't seem to be, um, you have to have expertise 
relevant to all of them um, to provide great care. But again, payment mechanisms for home and community-based palliative care and home-based services has been an ongoing challenge, which is why it's so limited thus far. Um, and I really hope to see that expanded dramatically going forward. Terrific. Well, that's a good place to end. Thank you so much. Really appreciate this talk. And thank you for taking on this such important area. So have a good Thank night, you. everybody. Thank you.